Welcome back to my series where I'm reading and reacting to the book Rich Dad Poor Dad. Last time was the introduction, today we're looking at chapter one. I'll save you time by not reading every word, but it won't be hard to capture the essence of each lesson. Dad, can you tell me how to get rich? My dad put down the evening paper. Why do you want to get rich, son? Because today Jimmy's mom drove up in their new Cadillac, and they were going to their beach house for the weekend. He took three of his friends, but Mike and I weren't invited. They told us we weren't invited because we were poor kids. They did? My dad asked incredulously. Yeah, they did, I replied in a hurt tone. Well, this is a great argument for the abolition of class and class distinctions. <laughs> and again, when I was a kid, I didn't really think, when I read it, and I didn't think about it, I wasn't a kid, I was in my 20s, but I read it and, and didn't really think about it very much, but it's so obvious that you know, the problem isn't that they're not rich. <laughs> the problem is that classes exist and people believe in them as some kind of, like, useful social marker, you know? Like, like oh, you're poor, so there's something wrong with you. We don't want you to come, you know? Again, it's it's kind of obvious to me. It's weird that, that, um, the, the, that the response to this is, I want to get rich. But that's the only, you know, that's the answer to this. My dad silently shook his head, pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose, and went back to reading the paper. I stood waiting for an answer. The year was 1956. I was nine years old. By some twist of fate, I attended the same public school where the rich people sent their kids. We were primarily a sugar plantation town. The managers of the plantation and the other affluent people, such as doctors, business owners, and bankers, sent their children to this elementary school. After grade six, their children were generally sent off to private schools. Because my family lived on one side of the street, I went to this school. Had I lived on the other side of the street, I would have gone to a different school with kids from families more like mine. Again, we're looking at a perfectly good case for abolishing class distinctions. You're saying that the rich kids get to go to the nicest schools and that you, because, you know, like, you're, you're just lucky that you actually got to go to one of those nicest schools, too. Uh, I mean, again, why, why do schools have differences in class? Why, why is that right, you know? Why, why is it that um, the, the rich get the chance to you know, perpetuate their wealth by giving their kids, you know, the best possible education while everybody else, you know, suffers in, you know, in just discipline school. After grade six, these kids and I would go to the public intermediate in high school. There was no private school for them or for me. My dad finally put down the paper. I could tell he was thinking, well, son, some people really call their son's son. He began slowly, if you want to be rich, you have to learn to make money. How do I make money? I asked. Well, use your head, son, he said, smiling. Even then, I knew that really meant that's all I'm going to tell you, or I don't know the answer, so don't embarrass me. The next morning, I told my best friend Mike what my dad had said. As best as I could tell, Mike and I were the only poor kids in this school. Mike was also in this school by a twist of fate. Someone had drawn a jog in the line for the school district, and we wound up in school with the rich kids. We weren't really poor, but we felt as if we were, because all the other boys had new baseball gloves, new bicycles, new everything. Again, I mean, you, you could question that. <laughs> you could question the value of always buying the newest and latest stuff for children. I mean, isn't that... A direct route to being spoiled. Mom and Dad provided us with the basics, like just food, shelter, and clothes, but that was about it. My dad used to say, if you want something, work for it. We wanted things, but there wasn't much work available for nine-year-old boys. Yes, it's not good advice. <laughs> what do we do to make money? Mike asked. 
I don't know, I said, but do you want to be my partner? He agreed. So on that Saturday morning, Mike became my first business partner. We spent all morning coming up with ideas on how to make money. I'm going to skip around a bit. So let's go to the end of this page here. My father was just leaving as I said that. Boys, he said, you're only poor if you give up. The most important thing is that you did something. Most people only talk and dream of getting rich. You've done something. They Basically, they tried to mint nickels out of lead, uh, which was illegal, and they told them to stop. But nonetheless, I'm very proud of the two of you. I'll say it again. Keep going. Don't quit. Yeah, I mean, again, those are that's good advice. This is uh, this book is full of good basic advice. It just doesn't know how to question the system that it's operating in. I'm going to be jumping around the pages a little, you know, save you some time. Let's start at the top here. Mike says you want to learn to make money. Is that correct, Robert? Oops. I nodded my head quickly, but with a little trepidation. He had a lot of power behind his words and smile. Okay, here's my offer. I'll teach you, but I won't do it classroom style. You work for me, I'll teach you. You don't work for me, I won't teach you. I can teach you faster if you work, and I'm wasting my time if you just want to sit and listen like you do in school. That's my offer. Take it or leave it. Uh, may I ask a question first? I asked. No. Take it or leave it. Whoa, okay. So don't in discourage questions then. Great. Go ahead. <laughs> um, no, take it or leave it. I've got too much work to do to waste my time. If you can't make up your mind decisively, then you'll never learn to make money anyway. Well, that's partly true, but I mean, this is actually a salesperson's trick. Like, you you have, uh, you know, to limit the person's time um, that they're allowed to decide. You know, that's why they say things like, you know, uh, this offer is ending really quickly, so you have to make up your mind now. Um, I mean... It might be true that, yeah, you have to be decide. You have to learn to be decisive. But I mean, surely you don't have to decide on make all your decisions on the spur of the moment. Um, opportunities come and go. Being able to know when to make quick decisions is an important skill. You have the opportunity that you asked for. School's beginning, or it's over in ten seconds. Mike's dad said with a teasing smile. Take it, I said. Take it, said Mike. Good, said Mike's dad. Mrs. Martin will be by in ten minutes. After I'm through with her, you'll ride with her to my superette, you know, like a 7-Eleven or whatever, and you can begin working. I'll pay you ten cents an hour, and you'll work three hours every Saturday. But I have a softball game today, I said. Mike's dad lowered his voice with, to a stern tone. Take it or leave it, he said. So, you know... Basically, he's saying, like, you have to give up all your other stuff, which is actually kind of prescient, you know? Like, yeah, if you want to focus on money, <laughs> then you probably have to give up on everything else until you're rich. And even then, you know, when you're rich, you still might be so busy working and managing your empire that uh, <clears throat> you won't have time for softball even then. By 9 a.m. that day, Mike and I were working for Mrs. Martin. She was a kind and patient woman. She always said that Mike and I reminded her of her two grown sons. Although kind, she believed in hard work and kept us moving. We spent three hours taking canned goods off the shelf, brushing each can with a feather duster to get the dust off, and then restacking them neatly. It was excruciatingly boring work. I mean, they're learning to be the employees that they hope to employ. Mike's dad, whom I call my rich dad, owned nine of these little superettes, each with a large parking lot. They were the early version of 7-Eleven convenience stores, little neighborhood grocery stores where people bought items such as milk, bread, butter, and cigarettes. The problem was that this was Hawaii before air conditioning was widely used, and the stores could not close their doors because of the heat. On two sides of the store, the doors had to be wide open to the road and parking lot. Every time a car drove by or pulled into the parking lot, dust would swirl and settle in the store. 
we knew we had a job as long as there was no air conditioning. So not only are they learning to to be employees and to give employees menial tasks and that that's how business works. Also, you know, not allowed air conditioning, breathe in a bunch of dust to your workplace. And again, the, this is the this is going to become the normal way to treat employees because, you know, you've you've spent a couple of hours as a kid being an employee so you can sympathize with your employees when you're rich right for three weeks mike and i reported to mrs martin and worked our three hours by noon our work was over and she dropped three little dimes in each of our hands now even at the age of nine in the mid-1950s 30 cents was not too exciting comic books cost 10 cents back then so i usually spent my money on comics and went home by Wednesday of the fourth week, I was ready to quit. I had agreed to work only because I wanted to learn to make money from Mike's dad. And now I was a slave for 10 cents an hour. On top of that, I hadn't seen Mike's dad since that first Saturday. I'm quitting, I told Mike at lunchtime. School was boring, and now I didn't even have my Saturdays to look forward to. But it was the 30 cents that really got to me. This time Mike smiled. What are you laughing at? I asked with anger and frustration. Dad said this would happen. He said to meet with him when you were ready to quit. <laughs> so it's like just this elaborate trick, basically. See, you'll see that the whole thing was just like, you know, it's, it's a kind of way of bringing that reaction out of him. Basically, Mike's dad is the kind of teacher who doesn't tell you what you're even learning, you know? Like, what if he had never wanted to quit? What if he had just kind of waited patiently for these lessons that were supposed to be forthcoming? Like, okay, I guess you're not allowed to just learn that way. You're only allowed to learn the hard way. There's other ways to learn. <laughs> like, I'm a teacher. Um, all right, let's skip all that laughing at. <clears throat> I was ready to face Mike's dad. Even my real dad was angry with him. My real dad, the one I call the poor one, thought my rich dad was violating child labor laws and should be investigated. Yeah, those laws are there for a reason. My educated poor dad told me to demand what I deserve, at least 25 cents an hour. My poor dad told me if I didn't get the raise, I was to quit immediately. You don't need that damn job anyway said my poor dad with indignation. At eight o'clock Saturday morning, I walked through the door of Mike's house when Mike's dad opened it. Take a seat and wait in line, he said as I entered. He turned and disappeared into his little office next to a bedroom. I looked around the room and didn't see Mike anywhere. Feeling awkward, I cautiously sat down next to the same two women who were there four weeks earlier. They smiled and slid down the couch to make room for me. Forty-five minutes went by, and I was steaming. Yeah, I would be too. See, to these rich guys, you know, their their employees' time is their time. So, you know, if you have to wait around, then, you know, too bad for you. The two women had met with him and left thirty minutes earlier. An older gentleman was in there for twenty minutes and was also gone. The house was empty. Here I sat in a musty, dark living room on a beautiful, sunny Hawaiian day, waiting to talk to a cheapskate who exploited children. I could hear him rustling around the office, talking on the phone and ignoring me. I was ready to walk out, but for some reason I stayed. Finally, 15 minutes later, at exactly 9 o'clock, Rich Dad walked out of his office, said nothing, and signaled with his hand for me to enter. I understand you want a raise or you're going to quit, Rich Dad said as he swiveled in his office chair. Well, you're not keeping your end of the bargain, I blurted out, nearly in tears. It was really frightening for me to confront a grown-up. You said you would teach me if I worked for you. Well, I've worked for you. I've worked hard. I've given up my baseball games to work for you, but you haven't kept your word, and you haven't taught me anything. You're a crook like everyone in town thinks you are. You're greedy. You want all the money and don't take care of your employees. You made me wait and don't show me any respect. I'm only a little boy, but I deserve to be treated better. I mean, yes. <laughs> like, all that's true. I mean, like, it's like we're going to 
learn that, oh, no, that was all justified because, you know, teaching you a lesson. That's the only possible way to have taught this lesson. Rich Dad rocked back in his swivel chair, hands up to his chin, and stared at me. Not bad, he said. In less than a month, you sound like most of my employees. What? I asked. Not understanding what he was saying, I continued with my grievance. I thought you were going to keep your end of the bargain and teach me. Instead, you want to torture me? That's cruel. That's really cruel. I am teaching you, Rich Dad said quietly. Yeah, sort of. Teaching him how to be an employee. What have you taught me? Nothing, I said angrily. You haven't even talked to me once since I agreed to work for Peanuts. Ten cents an hour? Ha! I should notify the government about you. We have child labor laws, you know. My dad works for the government, you know. Wow, said Rich Dad. Now you sound like most of the people who used to work for me. People I've either fired or have quit. So what do you have to say? I demanded, feeling pretty brave for a little kid. You lied to me. I've worked for you, and you've not kept your word. You haven't taught me anything. How do you know I've not taught you anything? Asked Rich Dad calmly. Well, you've never talked to me. I've worked for three weeks, and you haven't taught me anything, I said with a pout. Does teaching mean talking or a lecture? Rich Dad asked. Well, yes. Well, no. It doesn't. <laughs> I mean, this, okay, this is an important lesson. This is a good anti-school lesson that I would be happy also to teach, that talking and lecturing is not the basis of learning. Uh, that's how they teach you in school, he said, smiling. But that's not how life teaches you, and I would say that life is the best teacher of all. Okay, but, um, it's not life. You're the one who employed them. <laughs> You're the one that's doing all this. Trust me, I'm, I'm life. I'm just life. I'm just representing life. Adults are always saying that to kids whenever they want to do something shitty for them, you know? Like, oh, but that's the way life is. You just gotta learn it. If you learn life's lessons, you will do well. If not, life will just continue to push you around. I mean, again, I agree with that. <laughs> Superficially, again, his, his advice is good. People do two things. Some just let life push them around. Others get angry and push back. But they push back against their boss or their job or their husband or their wife. They don't know it's life that's pushing yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can call it life, but that lends it a whole kind of inevitability. The problem is that what he calls life are, like, man-made systems that benefit the rich and powerful at the expense of everybody else. So you can call it life, but really... Um, it is something to push back on. Now, what he's going to explain, I don't think I need to read the whole thing, is that, you know, you, you can blame your job, blame your boss, blame low pay, that kind of thing. Um, and that you shouldn't, you should take those as lessons. And in a way, that's right. But um, the lesson that you should be learning is not that, like, you should be just trying to get rich and screw everybody else, you know? Like, the, the lesson you should learn is that nobody should have to suffer under these systems, and that the system should be eliminated. So, when we read back, when we read this part about, like, pushing back against, he's right that you shouldn't just be pushing back against, like, your boss, your job, your husband, or wife. I agree with that. You should be push pushing back against the system itself. And what he's saying is, no, stop pushing. Just, you know, become an owner. If you learn this lesson, you'll grow into a wise, wealthy, and happy young man. If you don't, you'll spend your life blaming a job, low pay, or your boss for your problems. You'll live life always hoping for that big break that will solve all your money problems. Yes, that is dangerous. Don't live for that. I agree with all that waiting waiting for a raise you know i can't leave my job because i'm up for a promotion in the next 12 months in fact i think uh, there's a line about that in this book i don't remember rich dad looked over at me to see if i was still listening his eyes met mine we stared at each other communicating through our eyes finally i looked away once i had absorbed his message i knew he was right i was blaming him and i did ask to learn i was fighting 
which I continued, or if you're the kind of person who has no guts, you just give up every time life pushes you. If you're that kind of person, you'll live all your life playing it safe, doing the right thing, saving yourself for some event that never happens. Then you die a boring old man. Yeah, agree, I, I still can agree with all that. Again, on the surface. You'll have lots of friends who really like you because you were such a nice, hard-working guy, but the truth is that you let life push you into submission. Well, that part's a little different. I mean, some people, yes. You know, like the white middle class, which is what I've grown out of. Like, yeah, I would agree that that's, you know, that that accurately describes them. Um, but then there's like the poor, you know, billions of people around the world. They don't just let life push them into submission. They get beaten up and imprisoned. That's what submission, like be beating them up into submission means if you're poor. All right. Deep down, you were terrified of taking risks. You really wanted to win, but the fear of losing was greater than the excitement of winning. Um, okay, this is also kind of a problem here. There's, there's good and bad in here. This actually, on the one hand, it reveals, um, I don't know what truth about human nature, but certainly something that um, psychologists have documented quite widely, that the fear of losing something um, tends to be much more powerful than um, the promise of winning. I mean, that's, that's basically true for most people. The problem to me is, is what we're calling winning. I mean, what in, in his world, in Rich Dad's world, winning is winning the competition, a competition for money and stuff like that. Um, why is that the competition? Why is that the winning that we're supposed to be working for? Like that just means that when I win, someone else has lost. What I want is to for for everybody to win you know and if if that i mean maybe not everybody but the people who run and make all their money off these oppressive systems i don't care if they lose they're gonna have to lose at some point um but i think everyone else wins if they lose and i think that's what we should be aiming for all right you've been pushing me around i asked some people might say that, smiled Rich Dad. I would say I just gave you a taste of life. Yeah, that's, that's always what I'm doing. It's a taste of life, Snowflake. Get used to it. What taste of life? You boys are the first people who've ever asked me to teach them how to make money. I have more than 150 employees, and not one of them has asked me what I know about money. Oh yeah, like you would answer your employees. As if you would, like, give them lessons like this. What? Like, don't, don't make us, like, like, they know that. They know you, that you wouldn't because you're busy and so on. So, of course, they've never asked you. Like, I get what they're saying, what, what Rich Dad is saying, that, you know, that they should be asking for advice and how to make money and, and learn that kind of thing. Yeah, it's true. But, I mean, <laughs> like, as if you would have time for them. They asked me for a job and a paycheck, but never to teach them about money. So most will spend the best years of their lives working for money, not really understanding what it is they're working for. So when Mike told me you wanted to learn how to make money, I decided to design a course that mirrored real life. I could talk until I was blue in the face, but you wouldn't hear a thing. So I decided to let life push you around a bit so you could hear me. That's why I only paid you 10 cents. So what's the lesson I learned from working for only 10 cents an hour, I asked? That you're cheap and exploit your workers? <laughs> See, that's accurate. <laughs> it's accurate. Although really the lesson that he's teaching is that's how you get rich. By being cheap and exploiting your workers. Because that is. It is. In fact, he's basically going to prove it uh, coming up. Dad laughed. You'd, you'd best change your point of view. Stop blaming me and thinking I'm the problem. That's right. The, the system that forces us to use money is the problem. If you think I'm the problem, then you have to change me. If you realize you're the problem, then you can change yourself. 
yeah, although if the boss is the problem, you could expropriate the, uh, the, the, what, the, what they own. <laughs> although I don't know, I don't know how two little boys would do that. If you realize that you're the problem, then you can change yourself. Okay, but you're not the problem. You can change yourself, learn something, and grow wiser. Most people want everyone else in the world to change but themselves. Let me tell you, it's easier to change yourself than everyone else. Yeah, I mean, again, that's all true, and and yeah, you should focus on... If, if you're going to change anyone, yeah, change yourself. But you don't have to change people. People are very much affected by the institutions around them um you know like legal institutions the 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 need for money you know that kind of thing um you know if if you eliminate those systems and i know it's a huge task but the the the, the people will act differently and they will think differently because they won't be oppressed anymore they won't be forced to use money to work for other people all the time. Like, yeah, don't don't change other people. Just unite with them to destroy these systems. Don't blame me for your problems, Rich Dad said, growing impatient. But you only pay me 10 cents. So what are you learning? That you're cheap? See, you think I'm the problem, but you are. Well, keep that attitude and you'll learn nothing. Keep the attitude that I'm a problem. And what choices do you have? Well, if you don't pay me more and show me more respect and teach me, I'll quit. Well put, Rich Dad said, and that's exactly what most people do. They quit and go looking for another job, a better opportunity, higher pay, actually thinking that this will solve the problem. In most cases, it won't. So that's all true. Um, but, then, but then that's what we've been taught our whole lives. And you can't really blame the schools. Like, you know, they love to blame the school for that kind of thing. I blame the school for existing. Just the fact that it doesn't teach financial education, like, that just makes it a normal school. Like, they never... Schools are not about teaching things uh, that are useful for people so they can get rich. <laughs> That's really not what a school is. I made a whole series on schools. Check out my playlists if uh, you haven't seen it. So, what will solve the problem? This, he said, leaning forward in his chair and tapping me gently on the head, this stuff between your ears. It was at that moment that Rich Dad shared the pivotal point of view that separated him from his employees and my poor dad, and led him to eventually become one of the richest men in Hawaii. While my highly educated but poor dad struggled financially all his life. It was a singular point of view that made all the difference over a lifetime. And that is... The poor and middle class work for money. The rich have money work for them. Okay, so <laughs> let's uh, let's address this second point. The rich have money work for them. That's a really important point. Um, and it's I don't know if it's because of this book, but it's certainly a very widespread thing to say. You know, when you're rich, money works for you. Uh, okay, does it? <laughs> is it money that works for you? Well, where where do the rich put their money? Let's take uh, a business. They might invest it in a business, right? Um, is it the rich person who's doing the work? No. The rich person employs employees. And the employees do all the work. And so what that means is that it's not money that's working for them. It's still their employees, see? But they make their money by giving their employees less money than the value they create. And, and the owners just take the rest, right? Uh, it's kind of how, I mean, it's not exactly, but that's basically how business works. And that's how employees work and all that stuff. So, um, so really... People with less money are working for them, not money. You can't get money to work for you. It's too abstract. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> money doesn't just, like, naturally get bigger by some kind of 
magical process, you know? It need, you know, people need to work to make that pile bigger. So it's employees. What's another way of making money? You could own land and charge people rent for living on that land. So is it your money that's working for you? No, it's your tenants. Your tenants are working for you. They're giving you money because you force them to. Because it's either, you know, live in your place or live on the street. Like it's either pay for month, pay to live somewhere or don't live anywhere. Just live in the streets in the parks. Like, so in other words, rich people, they just kind of own things. And that's what they mean when they say, you know, money is working for them. Hmm. Both dads encouraged me to study, but not the same things. My highly educated dad recommended that I do what he did. Son, I want you to study hard, get good grades so you can find a safe, secure job with a big company and make sure it has excellent benefits. Oh, man. <laughs> My rich dad wanted me to learn how money works so I could make it work for me. In other words, so other people would do the work. <laughs> See, it's, it's, it's just a euphemism. It's a euphemism for other people work for you. Money works for me. No, no, people work for you. These lessons I would learn through life with his guidance, not because of a classroom. My rich dad continued my first lesson. I'm glad you got angry about working for 10 cents an hour. If you hadn't got angry and had simply accepted it, I would have to tell you I couldn't teach you. You see, true learning takes energy, passion, and a burning desire. Well, sort of, yeah. Anger is a big part of that formula for passion is anger and love combined. Okay. When it comes to money, most people want to play it safe and feel secure, so passion doesn't direct them. Fear does. Yeah, there's there's some truth in that. You can I mean he he talks for a couple of pages here about they you know, they don't they don't learn about money, you know, and they they uh, they rely on fear. It's all fear. Right? It's fear that keeps most people working at a job. The fear of not paying their bills, the fear of being fired, the fear of not having enough money, and the fear of starting over. That's the price of studying to learn a profession or trade and then working for money. Most people become a slave to money and then get angry at their boss. Now, I, I agree that they are, in effect, slaves to money. And I say they, we mean we, everybody. Everybody is. Everybody who doesn't have tons of money already are, in effect, slaves to money. Now, what do you do with slavery? If you, if you were a slave, yeah, you, you want to get out of slavery, right? It would be great if, like, you could buy your way out of slavery and that kind of thing it has existed over time, right? But surely the ideal is to eliminate the slave system itself to abolish slavery isn't that like the obvious answer and when you've got tens of millions of dollars you're in something of a position to to make that happen but instead he perpetuates the system it's interesting uh, part on on the government here i mean the only time we ever talk about the government here is uh taxes because taxes are bad <laughs> um, and, and they are, but it's, I certainly disagree with their take on it. Um, I felt like that 30 cents wasn't enough, seemed like nothing. And that's how most employees feel when they look at their paychecks, especially after all the tax and other deductions are take out. At least you got 100%, 100% of a tiny wage. You mean most workers don't get paid everything? No, the government always takes its share first. How do they do that, I asked. Taxes, said Rich Dad. You're taxed when you earn, you're taxed when you spend, you're taxed when you save, you're taxed when you die. Why do people let the government do that to them? Okay, that's an excellent question. <laughs> the rich don't, said Rich Dad with a smile. The poor and the middle class do. No, they do not. See, 
this is another one of those fundamental lessons that is just wrong. It's it's the wrong I, I would never teach that. Because let's let's like break it down a little bit. The poor and middle class let the government do that to them? Let them? Let them? How the hell would they avoid it? How could you possibly avoid it? If you stop paying tax, the government will come get you. At least it might. It could. And besides, it's it's literally impossible to stop paying sales tax because, it, you know, and they still have to buy everything, right? So, I mean, you can't just stop paying taxes. It doesn't work that way. Rich people can try to do it. Yeah, of course. But, I mean, <laughs> again, that it goes to show um, how, how badly this system screws you unless you're rich. I'm skipping certain parts of it. Some of it's a bit lengthy and some of it's, like, repetitive. Um, but I definitely want to talk about one little thing down here at the bottom. Well, you boys had better start thinking. You're staring at one of life's biggest lessons. If you learn it, you'll enjoy a life of great freedom and security. If you don't, you'll wind up like Mrs. Martin and most of the people playing softball in this park. They work very hard for little money, clinging to the illusion of job security and looking forward to a three-week vacation each year and maybe a skimpy pension after 45 years of service. And yes, of course, that is part of the slavery that we're against, right? If that excites you, I'll give you a raise to 25 cents an hour. But these are good, hardworking people. Are you making fun of them? No, he's just paying them shit. A smile came over Rich Dad's face. Mrs. Martin is like a mother to me. I would never be that cruel. So, so basically, he pays these people as little as possible, you know, as little as he can possibly get away with, never offers him a raise or anything like that, never offers to help out, never offers a poor dad who's struggling to pay his bills anything at all, right? And, and Mrs. Mother is like, Mrs. Martin is like a mother to you. She's like a mother to you, but you know, if, like, she doesn't have enough money, well, that's too bad for her. But I would never make fun of her, because that would be cruel. Mm. Hmm. I just, I, I hate this, this mindset that, like, all the money that I earned is mine and only mine. Well, I could choose to give a bit of it to charity, but I may or may not, you know. It's all mine to control and keep and... The way I got it was legitimate, like, automatically, you know? If I have money, I'm a businessman, I I earned this money. No, other people fucking worked for it, and you just took it. Your part is not even necessary. Owners are completely unnecessary. All right, this part, he uh, keeps saying, I'll, I'll pay you more, I'll give you even more money. If, uh, if you don't want me to teach you, but, but, uh, he's saying, he says no, you know, basically no, um, I'll keep working for free. Good. Most people have a price and they have a price because of human emotions named fear and greed. First, the fear of being without money motivates us to work hard, and then once we get that paycheck, greed or desire starts us thinking about all the wonderful things money can buy. Okay, so again, this is true on the surface, but where did where do fear and greed come from? Like, yeah, I mean, they're emotions, they're normal emotions, but but they're very much sparked by this system, by not having money for example, right? Of course you're afraid, of course, because like the way the system works is that life is very precarious. At any, any month, you could lose your job and then, and, and lose your livelihood. And that means losing, you know, maybe losing your apartment, not knowing where your next meal is going to come from, that kind of thing. So yeah, fear is, is justified. It makes sense. Like, how could you not be afraid. What you know, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, 
Um, not everybody can like just save money and, and invest intelligently and that kind of thing. Like it's easy to talk to nine year old kids who, who, you know, who already have homes, like they're already in homes. They don't have to worry about their next meal. They don't have to worry about rent. But not everybody can say that, especially when prices keep going up and wages don't rise commensurately. So you say greed, well, we'll get to greed, but uh, I mean, they're two sides of the same coin. Because, and, and I've, I've made a whole video on greed. I don't know if, I think it's a bit of a scapegoat, greed. Uh, but anyway, let's keep going. The pattern is then set. What pattern? The pattern of get up, go to work, pay bills, get up, go to work, pay bills. People's lives are forever controlled by two emotions, fear and greed. Offer them more money and they continue the cycle by increasing their spending. This is what I call the rat race. You call. <laughs> is there another way, Mike asked? Yes, but only a few people find it. And what's that way? That's what I hope you boys will learn as you work and study with me. <laughs> this is why I took away all forms of pay. Any hints? We're tired of working for nothing. Well, the first step is telling the truth. The truth about how you're feeling. You don't have to say it to anybody else. Just admit it to yourself. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Sure. Um, feel the fear. Recognize it as fear. Okay, yeah, I mean... Basic self-awareness, sure, that's always useful. <laughs> um, they get a, yeah. They react emotionally instead of using their heads. They, they don't think of money logically. Maybe they don't have time to. But you're right. But it's not just a question of thinking about it logically. I think you should also look at the history of money. And I don't mean that Neil Ferguson ascent of money thing. I mean debt the first 5,000 years by David Graeber. Like an actual history of money that like shows you, gives, gives us a good idea of where it comes from. Um, like it's, it's an invention. It can, it can go away. It can be eliminated. And that's how... I've, that's what I did when I confronted it logically, you see? Like, yeah, I learned long ago that, yeah, like, I could get rich. You know, you gotta, you gotta get some money together, employ some people to work on your idea, something like that, right? And, and just pay them as little as possible for, for what they've done. Great. I mean, you could do that. Anyone could do that. But... But that just means that, like, you know, that there's, uh, like, th the fact is only a few people can get rich because, you know, everybody else is supposedly working for them, right? You know, if, if people are working for you, then, yeah, you can get rich. If you can't afford to hire people, how will you get rich? Think, confront it logically all you want. Great. <laughs> but like I, I kind of think the real answer is to eliminate these systems again mm. Mm. instead of admitting the truth about how they feel they react to their feelings and fail to think they feel the fear so they go to work hoping that money will soothe the fear but it doesn't it continues to haunt them and they return to work hoping again that money will calm their fears and again it doesn't yes we are stressed because we work Yes, we are terrified that we'll end up homeless. It's a very real threat under this system. I mean, it's all, it's all true. Again, it's all accurate, this stuff, this fear. Um, yes, money is running their lives. And they refuse to tell the truth about that. Money is in control of their emotions and their souls. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> but, but, and most of those people will always be afraid. They're forced to. They have to be. They can't just all own stores like you do. Like what? Like basically what Rich Dad is saying is like, I can save you two kids. And that's it. That's all I'm interested in saving. Otherwise, I'm, I'm about making money. That's it. That's all I care about. And I don't really respect that. 
I want you boys to avoid that trap. That's really what I want to teach you, not just to be rich, because being rich doesn't solve the problem either. <laughs> Let me explain the other emotion, desire. We're going Buddhist now. Some call it greed, but I prefer desire. Actually, I agree with that. It's perfectly normal to desire something better, prettier, more fun, or exciting. So people also work for money because of desire. They desire money for the joy they think it can buy. But the joy that money brings is often short-lived, and they soon need more money for more joy, more pleasure, more comfort, and more security. Yeah, that's all true. I've met so many people who say, oh, I'm not interested in money, yet they'll work at a job for eight hours a day because their bosses force them to? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> what Should they negotiate that down to two hours a day? Does that work? That's a denial of truth. <laughs> if they weren't interested in money, then why are they working? Because they have to. They, they're not interested in money. They're forced to make it. So Rich Dad says, you know, don't get into the trap of, of working for money. So how do we avoid the trap, I asked. The main cause of poverty or financial struggle is fear and ignorance, not the economy or the government or the rich. That is nonsense. That is spoken by somebody who does not understand the economy or the government or the rich, and how it systematically impoverishes people. What, people People only are poor because they're, they're afraid? No, they're afraid of being poor. Is it only because of ignorance? No, they're ignorant because nobody has ever told them uh, that they don't need to live like this. And by the way, again, that's nothing to do with school. Because school... At, even if we had fi so-called financial education in school, it, what, what would it teach exactly? It would teach things like how to pay your stupid taxes um, and like maybe something like how to manage a business. But again, you need like money, you need connections, you need a lot of, a lot of help to get to the position where you can be financially independent. It's a self-inflicted fear and ignorance that keep people trapped. Oh, fuck you. No, it isn't. It, see, this is actually the, the, the typical right-wing line to everything. This is, this is the right wing. It, it's nothing to do with the systems that dominate your life. Nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with, with systems of violence, laws police the threat of homelessness and prison no it's nothing to do with with all those things those are just natural things that will always and should always exist that's all just bullshit like the lesson that they're learning is only like become yet another conservative employer look says rich dad school's very important you go to school to learn a skill or a profession to become a contributing member of society. Okay, well, um, you may be aware I have made a video that undermines this whole, this whole thing that you should become a contributing member of society. Moreover, we're talking about an owner, an owner of things, or a capitalist as they're also called, is not contributing to society. They're taking from society. They're taking the surplus value of everybody's labor and keeping it for themselves. That's what they're doing. <laughs> contributing? Huh. Don't contribute shit. Then he says, every culture needs teachers, doctors, mechanics, artists, cooks, business people, police officers, firefighters, and soldiers. Um, no, no, they don't. Again, you're just showing your ignorance. Every culture? Do you mean, like, all the state societies that you've heard of? Like, like we're, we're talking about a capitalist 
society, not every culture, a capitalist society where where these things are divided and regimented. Like there are like really we shouldn't have teachers as a profession. Everybody should be teaching everybody else. You know? Um why is artist a profession? You know, shouldn't we just be creating art? You know? Um, business people? Why the hell would we need business people? Of course we don't. Police officers and soldiers? Get the hell out of here. We don't need any of that. They, th Those people are there to enforce the system. And I mean, you talk about... And it's like, we need soldiers... And, and and the government doesn't, you know, the government doesn't affect you or anything. No, the government spells, spends about a trillion dollars a year on soldiers. So so to imagine that, that you know, you know, we need soldiers and they're, uh, and, and, and we need to spend a trillion dollars on it or something. Like, it's just an incredible waste. And it comes out of the, the paychecks and... Uh, of of everybody who pays taxes, you know, so yeah, like they do actually make you poorer, and then schools train them so society can thrive and flourish. Again, total nonsense. That is not what school is at all. And besides, school doesn't create these things either. School doesn't create, like, like I mean, you learn, you go to school to learn a skill or a profession. I mean, I guess he's talking about college as well. But you don't need to go to school to be an artist. You don't definitely don't need to go there to be a cook or a business person or to be a police officer or a soldier. And I don't know about firefighters, but I won't, I won't say because I don't even know. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so, but I don't know. Um, in fact, soldiers are people who couldn't go to college in many cases, you know? And so they can, so society can thrive and flourish. We live in a sick society, not one that's flourishing. Unfortunately for many people, school is the end, not the beginning. Well, that I agree with. So what does ignorance have to do with greed and fear, I asked? Because it's ignorance about money that causes so much greed and fear. Mm, just that. Not the extremely precarious nature of life in capitalist society. Let me give you some examples. A doctor wanting more money to provide better for his family raises his fees. By raising his fees, it makes health care more expensive for everyone. Okay, but let's, let's back it up a little. Why are you starting with that example, a doctor? Do doctors raise their fees for no reason? Because for the rest of us, it tends to hit us at places like at the supermarket and when we pay rent. See, those are the prices that are going up. Now, if you want to ask why those prices are going up, um, rich people tend to have very complex formulas. You know, it's inflation is like government doing this and then you know all those other various things and economists can explain it but the but the one thing you can be sure of is that you know big corporations and landlords are raising their prices so so that's what it is and and so things like food going up why would a doctor raise his fees or their fees let's say um why, why would they even bother? Well, because all the other prices are going up. So let's not put the cart before the horse. If the prices of food is going up so that even doctors can't afford it, uh, which might not actually be the case, but, you know, they, they might have, like, bigger houses that they need to pay uh, more tax on or something. You know, they still might not be able to afford things. So they go, okay, let's raise prices. That's why they want to raise their prices. It's not just to better provide, like it's that, but it might be just to, to maintain the same standard of living. Um, it hurts poor people the most, so they have worse health than those with money. Yeah, but I mean, let's, let's bear in mind, in the United States, there is no, like, universal health care. So, I mean, the poor can't afford doctors anyway. And they need, you know, jobs with health care, too. 
Like, it's just such a huge uh, factor in employment. Because the doctors raise their fees, the attorneys raise their fees. Oh, is that how it works? Because the attorney's fees have gone up, school teachers want to raise. Well, what? Where's the causal relationship here? Attorney's fees go up, so school school teachers need attorney? They all need attorney? Okay, sure, whatever. Soon there will be such a horrifying gap between the rich and poor that chaos will break out and another great civilization will collapse. We can only hope. History proves that great civilizations collapse when the gap between the haves and have-nots is too great. Sadly, America is on the same course because we haven't learned from history. We only memorize historical dates and names, not the lesson. Aren't, the prices, aren't prices supposed to go up? I asked. In an educated society with a well-run well government... <laughs> oh yeah, one of those. Prices should actually come down. Of course, that's often only true in theory. Prices go up because of greed and fear caused by ignorance. Yeah, see, he, he keeps saying it. It's the refrain. Prices go up, or um, life is hard, or whatever, because greed and fear caused by ignorance. See, it's a great way to, to individualize the problem. See? See, you just have to stop being so afraid. You know? Just don't be afraid of it. And then you'll become, like, financially independent, you know? That's that's all there is to it, bro. Trust me, bro. All you gotta do is lose your fear and greed, bro. Start to learn, bro. No. Because still, most people are gonna be poor regardless. But I agree they should work on their ignorance, because if you understand the system better, you can help us overthrow it. So after we get the fear and greed and ignorance gospel. Robert and his friend Mike search for a way to make money. Let's read about this, and it's actually a pretty typical kind of business story. On the one hand, it's it's smart entrepreneurship, and on the other hand, it's everything that's wrong with the capitalist system. At the end of the second Saturday, I was again saying goodbye to Mrs. Martin and looking at the comic book stand with a longing gaze. The hard thing about not even getting 30 cents every Saturday was that I didn't have any money to buy comic books. Suddenly, as Mrs. Martin said goodbye to Mike and me, I saw her do something I'd never seen her do before. Mrs. Martin was cutting the front page of the comic book in half. She kept the top half of the comic book cover and threw the rest of the book into a large cardboard box. When I asked her what she did with the comic books, she said, I throw them away. I give the top half of the cover back to the comic book distributor for credit when he brings in the new comics. Um, so, the distributor arrived. I asked him if we could have the comic books. He said, you can have them if you work for this store and don't resell them. You can't resell them, but you can have them. Remember our old business partnership? Well, Mike and I revived it. Using a spare room in Mike's basement, we began piling hundreds of comic books in that room. Soon our comic book library was open to the public. We hired Mike's younger sister, who loved to study, to be head librarian. She charged each child 10 cents admission to the library, which was open for from 2.30 to 4.30 every day after school. The customers, the kids of the neighborhood, could read as many comics as they wanted in two hours. It was a bargain for them, since a comic cost ten cents each, and they could read five or six in two hours. Again, this is a great, inspiring story of childhood entrepreneurship, right? But, <laughs> let's, let's try to ask a couple of other questions here. You can have them. They just gave them these comic books. So basically what they've done is take something that was free and available to all and started charging money for them. Now, if you're purely focused on, in, if you're a pure individual and you only care about making money and stuff, then again, that makes sense to you. You go, yeah, that's what business is, but that's the problem. Don't you see? All, that's what all business is. All markets, all commodification. See, it's to take something that could be just available and, and force people to pay money if they want it. And, you know, like, 
if you really um, understand that throughout the economy, then you can see what business is and why we object to it, you know? Um, that you can have something cheap or free or something like that, and then you can turn around and say, oh, but you can't have it for free. You have to pay me because I'm the owner. That's it. Only because I'm the owner. It's not because, you know, I deserved it. It's not because I did any kind of work, at least not necessarily. It's because I'm the owner. That's it. And in their case, they didn't pay anything to be owners. They just owned. They just found something for free and started charging money for it. Yes, I have a problem with that. Mike's sister would check the kids as they left to make sure they weren't borrowing any comic books. Oh, I know, it would be bad if they did it. In fact, this is, again, this is a perfect example. You've claimed ownership over something, and now nobody else is allowed to own those things. Even though, you know, like, who says it's even yours? Because you're holding it. That's about it. <laughs> um, but, but that's why we have security, because even if... You know, even if uh, you, you know, you shouldn't actually have those things, security is there to make sure you keep them forever. Um, she also kept the books, logging in, so she's also the accountant. Um, Mike and I averaged ten bucks, nine fifty per week over three month period. We paid his sister one dollar a week, and allowed her to read the comics for free, even though you know, like, like allowed her i mean we're so kind hey so so they're learning to underpay their employees they're learning to to keep the wages minimum and take all the surplus for themselves what did they do to earn it nothing and this is not the lesson of like you know let your money work for you either because they didn't pay anything they didn't invest anything But, you know, on the last page, it sounds like they did. You know, they, they talk about it as if, you know, they, they had been the ones that, that made all the money. You know, we learned to make money work for us. What money? Huh. No, you didn't. Um, we were forced to use our imaginations to identify opportunities. We started our own business. We're in control of our own finances. And the best part was that our business generated money for us. Even when we weren't physically there, our money worked for us. No. Parents make the money. They give it to their kids as allowance. The kids give that money to you. What the hell does that have to do with money working for you? See, again, it's the problem with rich people and conservatives and economists. They smother everything in euphemisms. So instead of saying, like, we took money for because just because we owned comic books, for we, we got money from people who were willing to pay because they didn't have access to free comic books like we did... Um, no, we can't say that. We have to say, our money was working for us. Our business generated money for us. Like, it's like some machine that just does the work. It's just a money-making machine. Rather than people whose money you are taking who now have less for everything. Hope you enjoyed Chapter 1. See you next time for Chapter 2.